Happy Father's Day, everybody. My sister reminded me of something my mom used to say about Father's Day, and she said that sermons on Mother's Day are all kindness and candy and flowers and wonderful things to say about moms, but on Father's Day, all the fathers are in trouble. I'm not going to do that today. Instead, I want to encourage you to not be just a good father, but a great father. So what makes a great father, husband, grandfather, or great-grandfather? First, I want to congratulate you on being here or watching online today. This puts a, you a step ahead of a lot of men, and it means that you're interested in God's plan for you and, and his words to you and how to be a godly man. Now, I'm just not talking about fathers today or two fathers today. If you are a role model in any way, what I'm talking to you about today uh, will relate to you, I hope, as a mom or a dad, a guardian, teacher, coach, uncle, boss, or bus driver. You have a direct influence on those who look up to you, and believe me, they look up to you. You're going to hear me address mostly fathers today because, well, it's Father's Day, right? But I hope you will be able to apply some of the things I say to your life and it will make sense to you. I don't know if I was a good father or not. All I can remember is the mistakes I made, like the banana peel on the floor. We have three boys, all about two years apart, and at this time they were like six, eight, and ten years old. I was walking through the house one day and between the living room and the kitchen, there was a banana peel on the floor. And all the boys were watching TV, some program, and then I said, who threw the banana peel on the floor? Now, I swear to you that all I was gonna say is, pick it up and put it in the trash. But when I said, who put the banana peel on the floor, they all looked at me with this blank stare and shaking heads, nobody. But one thing I knew for sure, it wasn't me and it wasn't their mother who dropped the banana peel on the floor. That left them. So I said again, who put the banana peel on the floor? In a little bit more of a stern voice. Nothing. Blank stares, shaking heads. They knew nothing about it. Now I'm getting upset. I was a father that never ever let something like this just slide by or ignore someone lying. That just teaches them that they can lie and get away with things. And one of them was lying. Who though was the question? Okay, I said, turn off the TV. We're gonna figure this out. So I gave them all one more chance. Who put, looking them straight in the eye, who put the banana peel on the floor? Nothing. So using the wisdom of Solomon, I said, okay, everybody's going to get a spanking. So I said this because I was pretty sure, I was about 90% sure it was my middle son, Justin. Justin was the culprit, I thought, because he was always eating something and throwing the trash and pits, peach pits and peels or whatever, behind the couch. That was Justin. So I was pretty sure it was him. So no one said anything. Well, so I called Justin out for the first swat because I thought, well, he's going to confess. So he comes up, gets his swat, never says anything about it. And I was pretty surprised. Now I gave hard swats, not like their mother. Their mother used to use a spoon or a hairbrush or whatever was handy at the time. And it rarely hurt the boys. Matter of fact, as they got older, they would laugh through it, which really made her mad. And, uh, but not so much with dad. Justin took his spanking without saying a, a, a word. And I thought, well, he must not have been him. I mean, he wouldn't want his brothers to get a spanking for something he did, would he? Next was my youngest son, Levi. So I was 10% sure it was probably Levi. 
But Levi hated spankings. He always wanted to know how many, how hard, and, and they were going to be. He was already crying and holding his hiney and, and flipping around like a bass. At just about the time I was rearing back to give him a swat, he says, okay, okay, I did it. I dropped the banana peel on the floor. And I said, okay, Levi, thank you for telling the truth, but here's the deal. You're going to get a swat for leaving the banana peel on the floor, and you're going to get two more for lying, because it's important not to lie. So Levi got his swats, and it was all over. And I looked over, and Gabe's on the couch, grinning from ear to ear, because somehow this time he had escaped a swat. So the story goes on. Because I'm feeling guilty now about my son, Justin, who I gave a swat and he didn't deserve it. So after dinner, I told Justin how sorry I was and that he could stay up late that night and we'd have ice cream and popcorn. He gleefully accepted my apology as a peace offering because, you know, parents make mistakes, right? But that's not the end of the story. Some 15 years later, we were having a family gathering. It was Thanksgiving or Christmas or something. We had our boys, their wives, and some of their kids there at the time. And this story comes up, the now famous banana peel on the floor story. When my middle son, Justin, now a cop, says, yeah, I was really the one that threw the banana peel on the floor. What? Are you kidding me? And about that time, we all realized something. We swung our heads over to look at Levi and said, Levi, why in the world would you confess to dropping a banana peel on the floor and getting a swat for it? He says, I don't know. I just panicked. So I will ask you again, what makes a great father? Because we all make mistakes. We've all screwed up. Is it the Bible? Is, just, is knowing the Bible inside and out make you a great father? Well, the Bible certainly is a great tool used correctly, but not necessarily what makes a great dad. I think we have all known Christian men or those who were strict church growers who were not necessarily good dads. As a matter of fact, isn't it almost always the pastor's kids that are the wildest kids in school? It certainly was when I was in school. And that was my number one fear when I was asked to be a, a pastor up in Portland was for my kids. And it was the only thing that caused me pause in going into full-time ministry. I was worried about my kids and how they would turn out and what would happen. So about two years or two or three years into the ministry, I asked the boys if they liked me being a pastor or not. And they said, yeah, we like it. And I said, why? And they said, because you can go to our games. This answer surprised me, but it shows you what's important to kids. Now, God's word can definitely make you a better father, husband, and person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone in anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and be, behold, all things become new. If you are following Christ and his teaching and striving to be a better Christian, husband, father, employee, friend, this will definitely help others to look up to you and even want to be like you, especially your kids. However, if you are living one way on Sunday and another way the rest of the week, your kids are going to see that also. And that is exactly what they'll emulate. The same is true in attending church. If it's not a priority for you, as your kids get older and start raising their own families, it won't be a priority for them because that is what they were taught. This I have seen over and over and over again, sadly. But let's face it, there are a lot of great dads out there that aren't Christians at all. For many years, my dad was one of those. My dad was not a Christian when I was growing up, but he was still a great dad. 
as I was preparing, preparing for the message today, I was thinking, what made my dad a great dad? What can I say today to fathers and grandfathers and anyone who has, influence, has an influence on kids to help them create a legacy to be admired and sought after? My dad was a good dad, but after becoming a Christian, he became a great dad. My goodness, my dad is so revered. Um, he's been passed away now for about five years, but still um, so revered by the family and even strangers still come up to me today and say, I want to tell you a story about your dad. The funny thing is my dad didn't even realize it. He didn't realize the influence that it had on so many people. Was my dad perfect? Oh, far from it. Uh, there were lots of times where I would just want to pinch his head off, as my mom used to say. Uh, he could be extremely frustrating, exasperating, narrow-minded, stubborn, very difficult to deal with. And I'm sure glad I didn't inherit any of those traits. Father's Day can bring up great memories and sad memories or terrible memories, depending on what you've been through. And I am sorry if they do bring up those negative memories but I want to remind you what the Bible says. It says in Genesis 50, 20, what others meant for evil against you, God meant it for good in order to bring about as it is this day. In other words, where you're at today sometimes reflects where you were at before and what God has done in your life and matured you and brought you through and made you stronger. My dad is a great example of this. He had a rough childhood. And he had a lousy father. His father was seldom ever home. My dad's parents fought so much that they would speak to each other. They wouldn't speak to each other for months, but they would speak to each other through my dad. His name was Frank. And they'd say, Frankie, tell your dad to pass the salt. This is at the table, three of them sitting there. Or Frank, ask your mom to pass the butter. After a time, his parents divorced. His dad became severely depressed and checked out of life really altogether. He was, now he was really never there. So I know he didn't become a great dad by watching his father or by his example. What that means is if you had a crappy dad there is hope for you. That doesn't mean you have to be one. Sometimes we can take those negative experiences and say, I want to be the opposite of that. My dad was my best friend. We hunted together, fished, explored, hunted arrowheads and rocks. We played tennis and racquetball together for many years. Um, later in life, we would do mission work together around the world. But my dad was quite unique in the fact that he was always ready to go anywhere and do anything. You could say, Dad, or the kids would come say, Dad or Grandpa, would you go jump the bridge at Foster Lake with us? He'd say, sure. Skydiving? You bet. Caving, hiking, camping, motorcycle riding, horseback riding in Eastern Oregon? Let's go. He was always up for anything. And of course, as a kid and grandkids, they loved that. When my dad was in his 70s, he would go with my sister and hike the Pacific Crest Trail from California to Washington every summer. Each trip was 150 miles long, and it took him about four summers, and uh, they were able to take a different pack animal each time they went. They used llamas, goats, mules, and camels. You might be thinking that he must have liked to hike. Well, not really. He went because my sister loved to hike, and he loved doing things with her. So is that it? Is that what makes a great father spending time with your kids? Well, yeah, and no. 
Some dads, some parents, sometimes can be too involved with their kids and try to live vicariously through their kids. They often make idiots of themselves out on the ball games and embarrass their kids to death. You've all seen this, right? I've coached baseball and, and soccer and things for years, ba basketball, and I can't think of a time where I didn't have a parent that was like this. So wait a minute, Danny. First you tell me to be involved, but not too involved. Then you say, be a Christian, uh, but you don't have to be a Christian. Uh, be a church-going Christian, but not too strict about going to chur church. And boy, this is complicated. Yeah, uh, sometimes it seems it is, uh, but I'm going to actually add to that. A great father disciplines his children. Wait, what? As fun and as great as my dad was, he was a strong disciplinarian. You didn't want to disobey or go against my dad. I'm just saying. When my dad says, don't do that, that is exactly what he meant. I learned early on that it was a lot easier to obey the rules than to face my dad and pay the consequences of breaking them. And over time, I gained his trust and I had way more freedom than my older brother who always broke the rules. Proverbs 13, 24 says this, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. We decided early on with our children that we would not count. I'm telling you, you know, do that. You got one, two, three. We would not use their full name, Gabriel, Neil, McCubbins, and we would not ask them to do something over and over again. We were going to ask them to do it once. And then we were going to get up out of our chair and correct them for not doing that and not responding. Then we were going to give them a hug. And we were going to tell them that we're sorry that they disobeyed and that we had to give them correction or a swat or timeout or whatever it was. We also tried to praise them heavily when they did good. So is that what makes a great father? A strong disciplinarian? Well, not exactly, right? Discipline alone without love fuels resentment and rebellion. Dr. James Doxson wrote, wrote a book called Dare to Discipline uh, back when we were raising our kids and we ate it up. It teaches you biblical principles which combine love and discipline together. Then he came out with the strong-willed child, and for some, this was a gift from heaven. If you are struggling with your parenting skills, there are a lot of very good resources out there for you. You are not alone. Find people or parents you respect and ask them questions. Ask for prayer, and the church can be a wonderful and great resource for you in help raising your kids. So now I have to give you some bad news and some good news. You can do absolutely everything right raising your kids with love and discipline in a loving Christ-centered home with good friends around your kids and watch them in Sunday school and youth group and grow up uh, in the church. And when they reach a certain age, they can zing off course. Some turn completely away from you and God. It is more devastating for parents than you can imagine. I have seen this happen to several really, really good parents without much warning. It is heartbreaking. It is also an insight to how much God loves us by, by giving us free will. And how he feels when we reject him and choose our own way instead of following him. This, however, does not reflect on you as a parent. It's really easy to blame yourself. And it's not necessarily so. But there is good news. The Bible gives us a promise about this in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
My brother didn't grow up till he was 40 years old uh, in the sense of uh, learning where he was at with God and where he should be at. Sometimes it takes that. So I ask you for the last time, what makes a great father? I think the answer is love. But it's a little more than that. Love and time equals influence. If you love your children, you will be interested in their lives. If you love your children, you will train them up in the ways of the Lord. If you love your children, you will discipline your children. If you love your children, you will sacrifice your time, energy, and self to be involved with them. You have to love them more than you love yourself. These are all examples of what Christ does for us and the love that he has for us. I'm not asking you to go jump off the bridge and foster or hike the Pacific Crest Trail. What I am saying is that love and time equal influence. We have heard this over and over the past five years ago. Excuse me, after my father passing away five years ago, people are still coming to us and telling us, I need to tell you a story about your dad or your dad when we go up there, he'd just drop everything and he'd treat us like we were kings. It made an impact on people. He treated them like kings because to my dad, they were. Every family member will tell you that my dad made time for them and that made him a great dad and grandpa. That makes a great father. And I would encourage you to work towards that end. 